And I'm Roy Zimmerhan. You know, I've been talking about securities lending for uh, probably about 30 years to uh, investors, to banks, to regulators. Uh, and with everything that's happened so far this year with the meme stocks, there's been a lot more interest. Excellent. Questions that would so, be uh, helpful to people if we could uh, just go live and answer questions for them. Questions for them. So that's the idea. Uh, I'll be talking about um, any sort of uh, important news events. Uh, and of course, I welcome any questions. So I'm by myself. So if uh, you see me looking off to the side, it's not because I'm ignoring you. It's because uh, I've got a few monitors going um, back and forth and uh, just wanted to make certain that I can sort of keep an eye on things. So by definition, these events are live and they're open to anyone. And I genuinely want to have questions. You know, I spent some time on Clubhouse yesterday. Uh, I was I invited up to uh, speak on the uh, uh, FT Alphaville panel and had a good hour session. Uh, people asked lots of great questions and I want to encourage people to do that. Uh, the reality is there's a bit of a gap and uh, uh, this is my first time doing it uh, solely on YouTube. So uh, we'll see how the chats actually go um, and hopefully I'll get the hang of it. Um, uh, look, uh, the reality is uh, there's going to be a delay anyway if you put uh, comments in, uh, but other than that, uh, why don't we just get to it? So uh, as I said, I'm Roy Zimmerhansel. I run Peerpoint Financial. We're a, a, a consultancy that's actually very much focused on securities finance. And what we mean by that is securities lending, uh, repo, uh, collateral management, prime brokerage, and that kind of space. And it's really very much historically has been an institutionally dominated business. But one of the, uh, in fact, one of the YouTube videos I put out uh, in October of last year uh, really uh, identified the rise of retail investors as a coming force in terms of the lending and short selling space. Uh, frankly, I didn't have any idea that uh, um, GameStop and the meme stocks would be uh, so important so quickly and so, uh, uh, so publicly. Um, but uh, there you go. You can never really uh, plan on that. But look, it's a, it's obvious that it was a coming trend. So so that was uh, <clears throat> that was one of the sort of key factors there. And and the business itself, when I talk about it being dominated by institutions, is that um, the uh, the size of the business is is a big one. Um, it's uh, about ten billion dollars of fees generated every single year for people that lend their securities. So that's a lot. Now, who's actually uh, doing the lending? Well, it's the institutions. And, and you're going to be surprised maybe that you probably make some money from it. Because if you own um, ETFs, if you have an, uh, uh, a corporate pension fund at your company, um, if you have an insurance policy, there's a possibility that uh, mutual funds and ETFs and all of these assets that you have lend their securities. And if they lend their securities, they make a fee. And as I said, that's $10 billion year in, year out, whether the markets are going up or whether they're actually falling. So it's a good sort of steady contributor to long-term income growth. So that's the size of the fees. Now, how much is actually on loan? Uh, again, this might shock people, uh, but it's about $2 trillion worth of securities are on loan day in and day out. And that's kind of split half and half uh, between equities and fixed income instruments. And the biggest group of assets actually are government bonds. Um, so it's a huge business. It really covers all of the capital markets and there's quite a lot of uh, revenue in it for uh, for people. So, uh, look, that's the introduction bit. Um, again, I'll be I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions as they arise. Uh, but look, I'm going to jump straight into it um, and just let you know that, uh, of course, in the U.S., it's been reporting season uh, for many U.S. companies. And securities lending is done by many U.S. companies. In fact, U.S. market participants are the biggest. 
a group of, of firms involved in the business. And so many of the largest providers actually do a split line item in their uh, quarterly uh, financial statements to show their revenues. So firms like um, uh, Charles Schwab, Bank of New York Mellon, BlackRock, uh, Northern Trust, uh, and State Street Bank. They all report it. So you can track the uh, the revenue and income there. You can see the sort of the ebbs and flows throughout the year um, and uh, the contribution that it makes. So uh, just as an example, so you can get an idea of how much money that that is. Uh, for BlackRock, for instance, uh, they made $127 million uh, in Q1 2021. Okay, and that's the amount that they made now, the uh, BlackRock funds, the people that they lend uh, on behalf of, make uh, probably even more than that. So it makes a big contribution to all of the assets they manage. So big business, quarterly results. It was kind of mixed results. Um, you know, as with many of the financials that we see uh, this year, you're comparing year on year and, and Q1 2020 was a very odd year uh, or odd quarter, obviously with the pandemic um, uh, either being uh, rolled out or lockdown starting to happen uh, or concerns about it happening. Uh, or in the case of China, obviously they started earlier in the quarter and, and came out earlier. So comparing Q1 2021 and 2020, I'm not certain it's it's really all that useful. Uh, but for, just for the sake of completeness, it's kind of a mixed bag. There's about half of the uh, half of those reporting actually had figures going up. So State Street was up eight percent. Um, what else do my figures tell me here? Um, Schwab for the first time kind of split out their figures because they haven't historically done that, and they did that partly because with the absorption of TD Ameritrade um, last year, it's actually made it a, a huge, huge business line. Um, so for them, their Q1 figure was actually $204 million from lending uh, largely their fully paid for client um, assets. So a big revenue earner. So those two were kind of up. Uh, Northern Trust, um, Bank of New York Mellon and BlackRock were down. But again, don't put too much into that. Uh, because uh, it's not really a fair comparison year on year. So that's sort of generally. Now, one of the biggest things that people may have heard about um, is short selling bans. So in 2008, after the Lehman default and markets were sort of crashing through most of that year, uh, up to 30 different countries put in short selling bans. So in 2020, with the sort of market crash in, in sort of February and uh, it spilled over into March, um, some countries did it. Um, only eight countries in total put in short selling bans. And that's uh, largely because all of the academic evidence showed that the short selling bans that were implemented after the great financial crisis or after the Lehman default part of that meant that markets were less effective. The spreads on the bid and the ask or buying and selling were wider, which meant people that were selling their stocks weren't getting as much as they, they had before the short selling bans. And people that were buying stocks paid more than they would have done in normal market conditions. So it's uh, it, it made wider spreads. Of course, if there's less trading activity because short sellers aren't in the market, there's just less liquidity. That's just kind of obvious. Um, and the combination of not being able to express that negative view through a short sale and having less activity and excluding those market participants means that price discovery is really something that you would question. If you have a skew of the market as to who can trade, obviously the bias will go in their direction. And so you don't really have a, a full view on, on, on stocks. Now, the reason I raised all of that is because of those eight countries that put in short selling bans, the one that has really been remaining from a big market is Korea. South Korea has had a short selling ban in place now for about 14 months. And this weekend, it expires. Hooray. So that's good news. The reason it's particularly good news is it's a very big and very profitable market. Korea has many world-class companies, uh, very large cap, uh, actively traded companies. And so they're very much part of the global spectrum and people will take a view on that 
lots of trading activity in those names and a lot of uh, short selling and borrowing activity. The interesting thing about Korea is that it's not just non-resident offshore funds. Um, there's a huge community of domestic hedge funds within Korea that also engage in short selling activity. So it's really frozen out um, institutional investors. And, and interestingly, there was a real exodus of foreign investors of any type, long and short, uh, and domestic Korean institutions who also were declining in terms of their overall market share of, of buying and selling uh, Korean stocks. And in fact, over the last year, the most dominant group have been retail investors. So as the institutions pulled away, retail investors filled that void. So to me, it'll be interesting to see what happens now that short selling ban is, is, is off. And, and again, almost paradoxically or ironically, I'm not sure what the right word is, but the regulators, while they're also reintroducing or allowing short selling again, they're now allowing it for retail investors. Now, retail investors have to pass an educational test. Um, so, um, uh, you can't just sort of pitch up, set up an account and start doing short selling. You have to show your broker that you have passed the edu education and you're able to short sell. So it's kind of an interesting um, paradox. If you just give me a second. Sorry about that. So uh, watch this space in Korea. Lots is going to change in the next week. Um, now, I just want to ask, I just want to take a, a bit of a break here and just ask um, uh, if, uh, just in case anyone is watching, uh, where you're actually watching from. So just kind of let me know that. Uh, and I'd be interested in, uh, uh, in uh, knowing. Uh, we do uh, a weekly live uh, event on uh, LinkedIn and on YouTube. It's available on both on Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m., uh, UK time, so British summer time at the moment. And uh, last week's session, we had, it was myself, one of my partners from uh, my Pierpoint consultancy firm, John Arneson. Uh, and we also had a special guest from IHS Market, Paul Wilson, who's global head of uh, securities finance at IHS Market. And, and we, had a, we had a great lively event, uh, lots of discussion about short selling in general, securities lending, GameStop, uh, and uh, emerging markets and why surprisingly many emerging markets have enabled securities lending and short selling over the past decade which is kind of counterintuitive for many so that again will be available that is available now on the youtube channel so just go to our channel and uh, and have a look at those videos so so that's south korea uh big news uh, the the uh, really interesting news, I think, or, or is uh, the announcement by uh, Fidelity in the U.S. that they are going to take their existing securities lending program, which lends out assets on behalf of Fidelity funds, uh, and also make their services available to uh, non-Fidelity funds and asset managers. And that's a big shift. Like if you go back into the history of uh, Fidelity, uh, for many years, they were very skeptical about securities lending because it fed uh, short sellers and uh, they didn't want to be doing anything to feed uh, the short sellers or make their lives easier. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, they changed their view over time and slowly started developing the capability and the infrastructure. And then more and more of their funds started participating and benefiting from the revenues. And now they're actually at the stage where they're saying they have enough confidence in their own program and their successful track record to be able to offer it to external firms. That's a really huge fundamental change. Now, you remember when I was talking about financials, that I talked about the big revenues that BlackRock makes from securities lending. And I think Fidelity and many other asset managers look at that and uh, you know, if they aren't lending at all, um, look, that's, a, that's a tough hurdle to make up, right? Because uh, those funds that are doing lending have an extra boost to their performance, as well as any money that the asset manager might make for its own, uh, its own business lines. All right, so that's a challenge. Uh, many, many fund managers actually lend, but typically they outsource it to a third party. Quite often they're custodian, 
uh, who already has control of the assets and runs the trading administration and uh, risk management of the positions after they're on loan. Uh, but they're also specialist intermediaries that do this business. So it can be a, I always get this confused, is it a complicated business or a complex business? Uh, I'm not sure which is the right description of it. But look, there's lots of moving parts to it. Um, you know, getting a trade on the books is one thing, and there's lots of support infrastructure after that. But look, Fidelity coming into the business is a huge fundamental shift, and I wouldn't be surprised to see others follow along at some point in the not too distant future. Now, uh, if I just take a step back, um, I've been writing a series of uh, uh, of posts on on LinkedIn, and what I've really been talking about is how in today's market, an investor really needs to learn how to sweat their assets. So uh, back in the good old days when, when I had hair, um, it was enough to buy an investment that generated a strong market return. And that was fine. But today there has to be more. And what I mean by that is uh, most activity uh, right now that that involves some kind of a counterparty exposure. So securities lending would be one, repo would be another, but derivatives uh, is probably the biggest uh, uh, community that uh, derivative transactions require collateralization. Because if I do a derivative trade with you, uh, it, by definition, it, that contract goes out at some point in the future. And how do I know that you're still going to be in business? So derivative contracts uh, have and require collateral. So whoever's exposed to the other counterparty um, uh, is required to post collateral. And that gets adjusted day by day as the PL um, positions change. Um, now, uh, all of that means that there's a huge demand for collateral. Okay, so collateral has become probably the biggest uh, fundamental hot topic over the last 12 years. And that's a combination of people's own risk management plus regulatory obligations, which have come in after the GFC requiring more collateral. Now, the reason I told you all of that is because securities lending has really two drivers, or really three. Let's talk about it as three. Number one, uh, if I short sell something and I don't have it, you're expecting it from me, so I have to borrow it from someone to deliver it to you. Okay, so that's one of the reasons why I need to do that. But let's say I'm not short selling, I'm just a broker and I've uh, sold something to you on behalf of one of my clients and that client fails to deliver the, the stock to me in time. Well, you have bought it, you're still expecting it in time. So um, what... Uh, what that means is uh, I can either keep waiting for my customer to deliver it to me, and then you're going to be asking me, Roy, where is my stock? Or I can actually borrow that uh, and deliver the stock to you. You pay your cash, and, and at least you're happy, and it's up to me to sort the problem out with my client. So that kind of operational settlement activity is probably the backbone of the business and what drives most of the individual transaction volume, but not necessarily so much from a fee perspective. Now, the real driver of it is uh, short selling, where someone needs to borrow a specific stock because they've taken a view. And they've either taken a view because they think that that stock price is going to go down and they want to buy it back in future um, for hopefully uh, at a lower, prof uh, lower price, therefore making a profit. And that's short selling. Uh, or it's part of a, a larger transaction. So there might be an arbitrage transaction, let's say the S&P 500 versus the underlying stocks. Um, there is a possibly a price discrepancy between the two. And depending on that price discrepancy, you might uh, short sell all of the underlying 500 stocks uh, and borrow them to satisfy that. Or if the trade works the other way around, you might buy all of those stocks. But, but look, all of this uh, we cover off in a series of our blog posts. Um, where we talk about the drivers behind securities lending activity. Uh, and look, uh, we also provide a free uh, primer on securities lending. So if all of this is just too complicated uh, and you want to get a little bit of a base grounding on that, uh, you can go to our courses 
which I've listed on there. And there's free courses on securities lending and on repo, as well as paid courses for those people that actually want to take it to the next step and learn even more about securities lending, repo, and collateral management. But there's free courses available for those of you that are actually interested at that site. Okay. So um, that's a little bit of a background on the short selling side and on the operational side. Uh, the main driver of fixed income uh, borrowing, and particularly government bond borrowing, is really just the need to get collateral, right? So banks have all kinds of regulatory obligations that mean that they have to be able to prove that if there's a liquidity crisis, such as was experienced in the summer of 2007, that the banks can continue to operate and serve their customers for up to 30 days without needing to have financing from external sources. And the way that regulators make them prove that is they uh, make them effectively hold government bonds on their balance sheet. So they have to buy the government bonds and just actually have them sitting there to prove that at any point in time, if there's a crisis that starts today, if everything goes uh, down the uh, toilet, uh, I've still got these government bonds, which you know government I can actually use to raise cash and fund my operations. So uh, that's that's one of the reasons that people borrow government bonds, just to hold on to them. The other reason that they borrow government bonds will be to use it in one of these collateral transactions where maybe the assets that they have aren't accepted by their counterparty and they want to upgrade the quality uh, of the asset that they have. So they kind of exchange the collateral they do have for the collateral that they need to give to somebody else. All right. So you can see how it gets uh, complicated um, pretty quickly. But look, those are the reasons why, as I said, I've, I've got a series of uh, blog posts going on LinkedIn um, that uh, uh, that covers off all of this. I think I've just done post number three or number four. Uh, it's going to be six other posts, so you can you can follow it there. And look, um, the way you can track me best is on LinkedIn. So if you aren't connected with me, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, to to reach out to me. I'd love to connect with you. Um, okay, so uh, I've got I've got a few minutes left here. What one of the things that I want to uh, talk about is really along the lines of this kind of education process. Um, look, I've been lucky, right? I grew up in the business uh, and you know I did my first stock loan trade in 1981. So probably uh, many people that see this live or on replay possibly won't have even been born. I did it by accident. I didn't really know what I was doing. Someone told me to sit down at the desk, answer the phone. People give you some information. Once you get that information, go to this list and call these people and uh, and work it out and uh, so i kind of did that and i'm just covering someone who was off sick um, so uh, kind of got thrown in at the deep end on a day and i loved it um, but the business has grown pretty dramatically right i think uh, that um, uh, if you look at it uh, the business is probably 10 times 20 times maybe even 100 times bigger than it was in the early 80s when I actually started in the business. And I used to describe it as a very much a profitable hobby because it was so small. And we were making up the rules kind of as they went along, right? So uh, what uh, hedge fund customers, who were usually the customers, what they needed, uh, we kind of built capabilities for and adapted and adjusted and a uh, little bit creative on our own end uh, and got more uh, participants into the ecosystem uh, that would uh, get involved in, in playing different roles, whether they were vendors or uh, advisors uh, or traders. The business grew. And what, what I realized is that um, you know, we were building the infrastructure that is still largely in, in use today. And we had the opportunity and the privilege of being there as it was growing and learning really from the ground up. And while that's great, I've always been pretty keen to share what I've learned over the years. And I, I've worked for some great people, 
Uh, I've met other great people. Uh, they've all been really open and uh, willing to share information and knowledge and give me training along the way. So I'm really passionate about the training side of things. And that's why we offer those uh, courses I talked about. And we'll continue doing that because I bought a training company. I bought a training company in 2009 uh, because I'm really uh, interested in making information uh, available to people so they can learn from what I've what I uh, have had the privilege to be part of. But that's great sort of generally. There is very much a specialist community that's involved in this business or people that really want to really dig into the, the, the deep part of the business. So I launched a membership club at the end of January for securities lending professionals. So every month we have an expert come in to talk about a key area of the business that is uh, timely, topical, and uh, sometimes even controversial. Um, so for instance, last week we had, uh, someone come in talking about dividend arbitrage, tax arbitrage, and some legal cases that are going on in, in Europe right now, uh, involving, uh, claimed and alleged tax abuse. Uh, so, uh, you know, very much court cases. Some people have already been found guilty raids on many banks um, and lots of court cases uh, under underway now or uh, pending future action potentially. So we cover all those issues. So <clears throat> that's a big part of it is the training. Uh, part of it is an online forum where people can ask questions in a safe and secure environment. Uh, and of course, we give them savings on on the courses that we uh, that we offer and things. But the the reason that we do it all within a membership club is, quite frankly, there's nowhere else to ask questions. And this business now is outsourced, and and there's uh, you know over 40 markets that do securities lending. So there's people interested in this in all countries around the world. And on top of that, most of the big institutions uh, have um, uh, outsourced operations that they um that they provide um you know that do their back office support uh their analytical support um a lot of the heavy lifting of running this business every day so that's in the the obvious uh, offshore locations uh you know so there's big big bodies of people in india doing this business um uh, malaysia uh philippines um, Sri Lanka, look, there's, there's a, a broad range of, of countries and that kind of trend has been happening a long time, uh, even, uh, onshoring within countries. So in the UK, we have, uh, we have, uh, uh groups of people that are in, um, uh, Birmingham and in Glasgow supporting banks, uh, Manchester. Uh, so, so that's been happening. And in the U S uh, it's been happening even longer. So you see, you've seen a real sort of geographic spread of the business. So this whole global community has been spreading out more and more, and it's been difficult for them to get information because they no longer sit beside the people that used to do the business. On top of that, of course, we've had lockdowns. So even if you were sitting beside the person, you haven't been able to ask them any questions. So we launched uh, the PeerPoint Alpha community. Uh, as I said, you know, we've got tutorials, premium, premium editorial content, and the community forum. And if you're interested, you can find uh, more information there. Look, I'm coming up to uh, the last minute. Uh, we'll have questions. Um, sorry, feel free to send your questions in to me. As I said, you can find me on uh, LinkedIn. So connect to me and send me questions on there. Um, we'll be uh, doing this every uh, Saturday at 1 p.m. UK. Um, if you are interested in seeing more, we do the live event uh, on uh, Wednesdays at 10 a.m. And I guess that's it for me. Thanks for your time and see you next week.